so these areas uh, typically cause a lot of um, excitement and anticipation. There's a lot of uh, high expectations, perhaps, um, about the impact that gene therapy and cell therapy can have. Um, and I thought I'd take this opportunity just to try and explain the rationale for these approaches and to describe some of the challenges that we will need to grapple with if they're going to become something that is um, of benefit in Stargardt disease. So Andrew Webster discussed this morning something about the basic um, pathology, the, the, the cause of Stargardt disease and its genetic basis. Um, and I'd just like to expand on that in simple terms to explain that the genetic defect in Stargardt disease has an impact on two main types of cells within the retina. So as we know, the retina is a sheet of light-sensitive nerves that's made up of the specific light-sensitive nerves, nerves themselves, but also of a layer of supporting pigment cells. So these two types of cells, the light-sensitive ones and the supporting pigment cells, are both involved in the condition and both need to be considered when we are thinking about how to improve outcomes. So the function of these types of cells and their survival depends on the availability of appropriate instructions that are encoded in the genes. And in Stargardt, Stargardt disease, a defect in just one gene means that these cells lack a critical instruction on how to manage toxic products. And this is something that Andrew touched on this morning. So this leads to harmful accumulation of toxic byproducts in the pigment cells. And given that these pigment cells are needed to support the overlying light sensitive cells, this undermines their ability to do that support. And the overlying photoreceptor cells, those light sensitive cells, therefore fail to see and they die. So this process typically affects the central retina. Um, and the reason for that is not entirely clear, but maybe because this is where most of the cones are and these are particularly demanding, or because this is where most of the cells are most densely populated, which makes it a very highly active and vulnerable part of the retina. So we have a gene defect in photoreceptor cells that results in um, poor function and survival of the cell, those cells themselves and the underlying pigment cells. And one perhaps obvious solution to this is gene therapy, that is to simply provide those cells that lack it the instruction that they need. And that is the basic principle of gene therapy. So the potential of this approach has been demonstrated by gene therapy in other conditions. And we at Moorfields and at other centers have shown that in a different condition, provision of a gene that's lacking can result in benefit with some improvements in some aspects of sight for a period of time. And that's something that we're actively working on for a number of different conditions. However, the challenge for Stargardt disease specifically is that the missing gene, the instruction that's required, happens to be very large. And it's so large that it's difficult to package it efficiently in such a way as to deliver it to the cells that need it, that is, the photoreceptor cells. So there's one, one clinical trial is ongoing using a packaging system, that is a vector, that can accommodate the gene, but this system does not appear to reliably deliver the gene to the cells that need it. So whether that will be successful is currently in question. So in the absence of an ideal packaging system, an alternative approach is to actually cut up the gene into pieces, into smaller sections that can be packaged and delivered more efficiently into the cells that need it, in the expectation that the gene can be spliced back together again inside the cell. And this approach is something which is the um, subject of a number of uh, research programs, and is something that does offer hope for Stargardt disease gene therapy. It's very likely, I think, that we will see trials of gene therapy for Stargardt disease within the, the next five years. So gene therapy involves providing the instruction to cells that are surviving but not working properly. But this can only work at a relatively <coughs> early stage of the condition when those cells are still alive. 
cells that have died cannot be expected to benefit from provision of the instruction. So in advanced disease, an alternative approach is going to be needed. And this is where cell therapy comes in. It's hoped that by providing new cells to the retina to replace those that have died, one might provide the hope of some benefit. The potential benefit of both pigment cells and, uh, and light sensitive cells has been demonstrated in the laboratory and experimental uh, models. Um, and at Morefields, we've been helping to explore the feasibility and safety of transplantation of pigment cells into the eyes of people with Stargardt disease. And we heard from some people this morning who've been involved in such trials. The expectation of this, this research is that ultimately it will lead to something that will provide benefit in terms of slowing degeneration, prote protecting sight, and perhaps improving aspects of sight. But, we, but it's a very ambitious proposal, very ambitious um, aim, and we have to be realistic about the, um, the level of benefit that we might be able to achieve, um, at least in the near future. The first trials are aimed ultimately at providing some reassurance of benefit, uh, sorry, of, of safety um, with this particular technique. Um, the potential dangers, actually, were illustrated only last week with the publication um, in a prominent medical journal of the devastating consequences that can occur when stem cells are delivered to the eye in a way that is uncontrolled and unregulated. And so the trial that we've been doing at Moorfields, um, thankfully, has not been associated with any adverse events, has been, has been safe and well tolerated, and there is some evidence that the cells that we implant appear to survive and um, appear to survive particularly in areas that are otherwise um, damaged. So this gives a conf confidence going forward um, in terms of the safety of the approach when it's carefully regulated, when the cells are carefully derived and characterized. Um, but it's going to be some time before we can expect to see benefit in this, uh, with this approach. One reason for that is that, well, there are a number of challenges, actually. One reason is that, as I mentioned before, the condition is associated with degeneration not only of the pigment cells, but also the light-sensitive cells. So ultimately, it may be necessary to provide not just the pigment cells, but also the light-sensitive cells in combination. Um, and that is a challenging um, aim. Another challenge is that the cells, even in the eye, are at risk of rejection. Like any organ transplant, cells coming from another individual uh, may be rejected. And this is the case in the eye as well as elsewhere. There's some suggestion that within the eye they may be relatively protected against immune responses, um, but we know that inflammation can occur in the eye, and we are um, very conscious that, you know, that um, administered cells, transplanted cells, may be at risk of rejection. More recently, there have been some uh, some work designed to uh, use stem cells derived from the same individual. And Anna is going to come on to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and the potential advantage of that is that there may be a less reject risk of rejection. And that is one potential solution. So another challenge in terms of cell therapy is to identify the optimal timing of intervention. This needs to be at a time when the in the course of disease progression, that the risk can be justified because the risks are identified, but before it's too late to stand to benefit. So cell therapy offers an opportunity to regenerate the retina, but we have to be very realistic about the scale of the ambition and the amount of time it's going to take before we can expect this technology to provide benefit. You may also have heard about electronic prostheses, and these are electronic devices that stimulate the retina in a way that is intended to substitute for the photoreceptor cells that have degenerated. Current devices can provide modest improvements in sight, aspects of sight, to people who really have little or no sight altogether. But such improvements would not be a benefit to people with Stargardt disease who still retain some valuable peripheral sight. So 
in summary, I have summarized the potential um, advantages and challenges of gene therapy, cell therapy, and touched on electronic devices. Um, and I think one of the big questions we often get asked is when can we expect these to provide treatments that could be a benefit? And the answer is that we have no answer. There's no guarantee, I'm afraid, of when we can expect them to provide benefit. But with the support and hope and belief that has been expressed at the meeting today, um, we can be confident that ultimately some benefit will be possible. Thank you very much. I just wanted to quickly ask, um, in terms of both therapies being used together, <clears throat> does that place them further off in the future as a possibility? Both gene and cell yes, therapies? Yes, yeah. as opposed to simply slowing the progression when you introduce the, the possibility of restoring some site. Does that place such possibilities much further in the future? Well, I think that there are potential um, advantages of combining <clears throat> cell therapy with gene therapy. And it may well be that before cells are administered to people, they might be modified with gene therapy. Um, but this is a, uh, an extra a, a layer of complexity, if you like, um, that is likely to require a great, it's, its own research, much greater research. So I think you're quite right that there may be additional advantages of that, um, but we need to take things one step at a time in a way that advances the field incrementally.